Hopefully you saw the computer system performance part one that goes over speed up and the iron law and how to take averages. Today we're going to talk about Amdahl's law and some more sort of ways of measuring computer system performance. So we're going to apply Amdahl's law and look at what it means when we analyze computer system performance. And we will talk about an alternative to Amdahl's law called Gustafsson's law. If you remember, the iron law is how we can measure the performance of a processor or really computer system performance by looking at how much time it takes to execute, run, finish a program. And we break that down into three components the number of instructions executed by the program, which is related to code size, but is not exactly code size due to loops and repetitive function calls. So instructions per program multiplied by the cycles per instruction or CPI multiplied by the cycle time. So the amount of time it takes for each processor cycle. Uh, history of computing dates back to the late 40s or so. 80s was somewhere in the middle now that we're in the 2020s. The 80s was all about pipelining. Pipelining can get you down to pretty modest CPI of just over one cycle per instruction typically. The ideal CPI for a pipelined processor is generally one, one cycle per instruction. In the 1990s, there was something called superscalar or instruction level parallelism, where uh, processors execute multiple instructions at the same time, and so you can actually get below one cycles per instruction. That generally is the purview of a graduate course on computer architecture. Here's Amdahl's law, fundamental equation in how we study the limits or really the, the benefits of computing. Here's a diagram showing if you have a number of processors that are working, from 1 to n, if we call h the time spent in serial code, and we call f time that is spent in parallelizable or vectorizable code, then h is 1 minus f. And so we can think of it either way. We can think of it in terms of the fraction of time that's serial, or we can think of it in terms of the fraction of time that is parallel. We're usually going to talk about f as the fraction that can be improved or that is parallel. So then the sequential part is 1 minus f. And so this bar chart shows you know, how much time you're able to use only one processor versus how much time you're able to use n processors. And the idea here is that you can get a performance enhancement out of the additional processors represented by V. Amdahl's law says that the total speed up of your system is equal to this equation, one on the top, and then we've got this quantity in the denominator of one minus F plus F over V. The serial part plus the parallel portion divided by how much speed up it has. This is the, the general form of Amdahl's law. One of the interpretations of Amdahl's law is to look at it in the limit. When the speed up of the enhanced portion of the program is infinite. In that case, that fraction of the program that's enhanced, the time that it takes goes to zero. The limit as the speed up v goes to infinity means that that quantity f over v goes to zero, which leaves us with this speed up formula. Our overall speed up is one over one minus f, which is nice because it can give you sort of an idea of the extent an enhancement could possibly increase overall speed up or overall performance. The conclusion then is that performance is limited by the serial portion. The maximum speed up you can get is determined by how much of the code has to be spent in that sequential unenhanced portion of the program. For a quick example, if f is 0.5, you can only spend half your time of the program in serial and half of the time of your program is spent in an enhanced parallel portion. And if the speed up of that parallel portion is infinite, then your overall speed up is one over one minus a half, which is two, which means the maximum speed up you can get is two, even if you have an infinite amount of speed up from your enhancement. We can plot this equation one over one minus F pretty simply. And here we have the X axis is showing how processor count increases, a log scale, 1, 10, 100, 1000, and so forth. Y axis here is speed up and up to 20. One processor, we have a speed up of one, 
because we have no benefit from additional processing. Under our assumption, we can get infinite speed up. We look at the different fractions of the program that are parallelizable. We talked about this F equals 0.5, right? So that's on the bottom, but it shows how it's asymptotically approaching the speed up of two. On your top line there with F equals 0.95, when 95% of your program is parallelizable, well, you still have 5% of your program is serial. 1 over 1 minus 5%, so that's 1 over 1 20th, which is 20. So maximum speed up is 20. What does that mean? Well, it means we don't need an infinite number of processors to take advantage of infinite idealized parallelism. If our speed up of 20 is achieved with 8,000 processors, we don't need an infinite number of processors because we're getting close to the limit of what we can accomplish in theory. A related notion here is uh, efficiency. Speed up equation in this scenario is the time it takes for one processor to finish the job divided by the time it takes for n processors to finish the job. Efficiency is going to be our measure of kind of average speed up, arithmetic mean of speed up in some sense. It's the speed up with n processors divided by n processors. Really, how much does each processor contribute overall to your speed up? So we've got here another plot, which is showing how as you keep increasing your processors, your efficiency goes down. You're getting diminishing returns from allocating more resources to solve this problem. Is time enhanced twice as much when we use two processors? Well, we already know it's not because of that fraction F that's not parallelizable. How much does it enhance by? So here we've got a, a line drawn horizontal crossing of an example for F equals 0.9. By uh, Amdahl's law, we have our speed up S equals 1 over 1 minus F plus F over V. Crank that out to 1.82 is the speed up. And our efficiency is uh, 0.91 because 1.82 divided by two processors is 0.91. The execution time of our program takes 10 hours in this example and one hour is serial. We can never ever get it underneath one hour. And with two processor cores, we won't get it under five hours, which would be you know twice as fast. It'll be something more than five hours. Here's an example. We'll walk through it. F, the enhanced portion of our system as 0.95. So when the number of processors we allocate to solve our problem is five, then our speed up we can estimate as 4.17, cranked through the same equation as the previous example. In this case, we're assuming that each processor can take on the same fraction of the load of the parallelized portion, right? So um, how to say this? When you have a, a parallelized portion of 0.95 and you have five processors that you allocate to it, the time it takes to execute that 0.95 portion of the program is divided by five. We assume each additional processor is going to carve up that parallelized portion. We look at increasing from five processors to 10 processors. Now that 95% of the program is now split up 10 ways, right? So when you double the number of processors, that fraction of the program that's parallelized, that will get twice as fast. But overall, the program speed up does not get twice as fast. Here we go, speed up of 10 is 6.9, which is not twice as fast as 4.17. Twice of that would have been, what, 8 point something. With 100 processors, we can get a speed up of 16.9. The infinite limit case is 20. Well, what do we really want to pay for? Where does the added cost of another machine outweigh the benefit of adding it? A thought experiment for you is many, many of the powerful supercomputers out there are large cluster machines with over 4,000 processing units. Is that many processor cores efficient? Well, that depends on the problem that's being solved and really on how much of the problem is parallelizable. 
an alternate perspective is Gustafsson's law. So we'll look at parallel computer as the example, because this is sort of the scenario in which Amdahl's law is often looked at. And the same example as before, we have a program that takes 10 hours and one hour of it is serial. Gustafsson's law is all attributed to this guy, Gustafsson. It kind of states if the same task would be solved on a serial computer, the task of one is equal to that one hour plus n times nine hours, the remaining hours. n is the, the n number of processors you would need. The speed up of n is one plus n times nine. That's the time it takes for one processor divided by 10, which is the total time it takes to complete the program. And then you can take the limit of that equation as n goes to infinity and you've got the n in the numerator. So now the limit goes to infinity. The trick here, a change of perspective, which is formulating the speed up is still the time of one divided by the time of n. But now in the numerator, we've got that n multiplication, right? So we've got one minus f prime plus f prime times n. And we can reduce this down to n minus this quantity, n minus one times one minus f. And this will go to infinity. As one minus f prime goes to zero, then the speed up of n goes to n. Well, f prime is different from f. On Gustafsson's law, when we think of f prime as 0.95, we get these numbers for speed up that are much closer to their idealized version. When n is 5, we can get speed up of 5 is 4.8. When n is 10, we can get speed up of 10 is 9.55, instead of before we were getting 4.1 and then 6.8 or something like that. So we're getting much bigger speed up. And the difference is that Gustafsson's law assumes that as you increase the number of processors that you apply to a problem, you scale the problem size as well. So the idea is if you add 100 processors, then you make the problem 100 times bigger as well. And therefore, you can get almost 100 times more speed up, assuming that the part of the problem that you're making bigger is parallelizable. And that's what the F prime is about. This is reflective of reality to the extent that oftentimes the serial execution time may involve loading data or communicating in a way that doesn't necessarily increase with the change in the problem size. Amdahl's law assumed that the problem size remains fixed and you just throw more resources at it. Two different ways of looking at it. We're mainly going to be thinking about Amdahl's law, but I do want you to be aware of sort of the difference. There's Gene Amdahl and John Gustafson. Amdahl's law was uh, codified roughly in the late 60s and Gustafsson's law um, from 1988. One was born in the early 20s. The other was born in the, the 50s. So that's the greatest generation versus the baby boomer generation. So maybe it was a generational thing of the time. Hey, boomer nowadays. So let's look at our first example. We can replace an existing processor with a, a 10 times more powerful one. The processor currently works 50% uh, of the time, and the rest of the time it's waiting for I.O. operations. What's the total gain that the CPU replacement achieves? We've got our F here, right? 50%. 50% of the time is enhanceable, and 50% of the time is not enhanceable by replacing the processor. Amdahl's law says S equals 1 over 1 minus F plus F over V. F is 0.5. V is from the Example, it says 10 times more powerful, so we assume our speed up is going to be 10x. We crank that out, and we get an overall speed up of 1.82 from replacing our processor with a 10 times faster processor. Gustafsson's law says, okay, you can get a speed up of 5.5 under the assumption that when you replace your processor by something 10 times stronger, you're going to make it work 10 times as hard, where the I.O. time is going to be fixed. When you think about it, this really kind of reflects how computing historically gets better. Buy a new processor, you expect it's going to be faster, and it is faster, and you make it work harder on programs. So programs get more complex, operating systems get more complex, graphics and other workloads get harder. You get more performance in terms of the speed up if you would run that more complex program on an older machine. All things being equal, if you took Windows 10 and you tried to take that back in time and run it, you would get a much worse performance loss than predicted by Amdahl, 
because you changed the scope of the problem over time. Um, this one just shows Amdahl's law example. Let's suppose we have an ADX speed up with a 100 processor system. Then we can derive what the fraction of the program is sequential or what fraction of the program is not enhanced. So we just plug into the equation. We've got Amdahl's equation S equals one over one minus F plus F over V. So if S is 80 and V is 100, then we can formulate 80 equals one over one minus F plus F over 100 and solve for F with a little bit of algebra. And we can find that F is 99.74 repeating percent. So roughly 0.25% of the program is sequential. How long does the sequential part execute for? Uh, this is a little bit trickier to formulate, but we can formulate it as one minus F. That's the sequential part. So how much time the sequential part executes for is one minus F by definition. And the time that the overall program executes is one minus F plus F over V as we've got from Amdahl's law. So we get that the sequential part executes for a total of 0 0.20 repeating, so about 20% of the time. So the top of that equation is just the sequential execution time. The bottom of that equation is the total execution time. So the ratio is the portion of the program that's spent in the sequential part. That's why that ratio works out. In general, the portion of the program that's sequential and the time spent in that program are not the same except when the speed up is one, which generally happens either when F is zero or when V is one actually is what that should be, I think. So computer system performance uh, is limited by sequential execution. We're going to extend this notion to say that computer system performance is limited by the portion of the program that you cannot enhance. So Amdahl's law can help us to understand the relationship between optimizing or enhancing part of a program versus the overall program performance or program execution time. So it applies for optimizing sequential code. So not just parallel code, but reducing the amount of time that sequential code executes by looking at F as the fraction of the program to which an optimization applies, and then V as the speed up from that optimization. Just as a sort of aside, Gustafsson's law applies when you increase the workload size. In general, we're going to be using Amdahl's law.